Well, uh, let's go ahead and get started then. Uh, this is Family Law 101, part of our continuing Pro Se Basic series. Um, I know you're somewhat familiar with uh, many of our classes, and obviously we're always glad to have you, uh, glad to have you participate. Thank you. Um, I'm Jonathan Briggs, uh, Assistant Law Librarian, and this is part of our series where we try to provide information uh, to uh, people, primarily pro se folks, people who are going to be representing themselves and various types of issues. So we try to provide information about legal processes uh, without giving legal advice, but then also talk about the interaction of the law library uh, with that uh, and talk about the courthouse in general. Uh, today we're focusing on family law, and this is the introductory course to family law. Uh, and then we have a follow-on course, which we'll be presenting again in a couple of weeks, uh, Family Law 102, that goes into a little more detail about some of the various types of cases and legal matters that can be uh, handled under the umbrella of family law. Uh, family law is an extensive part of what goes on here at the Justice Center. Uh, it, it's, you know, there's three courts and six judges fully lent over to family law. Uh, so it's, it's a lot of people come to the courthouse for that uh, issue, and a lot of people come to the law library for that. Uh, probably, I'd say at least half of the people we encounter uh, are dealing with family law issues as far as on the pro se side of things. Uh, it could be even more than that. Uh, I know I've done a helped a couple of uh, patrons so far this morning, and they've both been in relationship to family law stuff. So let's kind of jump right in. I'm gonna skip uh, some of the slides just because they're easily read uh, on your own, and I'll, I'll be sending a copy of this PowerPoint, this updated PowerPoint to you. Uh, so, you know, I got my, my contact information here, and you already have my email. Uh, you know, you're pretty familiar with uh, what we do here at the law library, our role as law librarians and the staff here, we have two law librarians and two staff uh, persons. Uh, you know, one of our staff persons has been here for over two years now, and the other one has been here for about a year now. And uh, so they're both uh, very well versed in what we do and they provide excellent service as well. So we're lucky to have them. Uh, you know, we've been around for a while, been here for over 30 years now, uh, and we've kind of, grown and improved and expanded our offerings, our services, uh, things we have available. Uh, you know, we're lucky. Uh, we're here in Fort Bend County. It's a pretty well-run county uh, as compared to maybe some other ones, uh, pretty well-funded county, and they use that money uh, well to serve the, uh, the, the people of this county uh, in many ways. One of them is the provision of this lawsuit that providing us with a revenue stream that allows us to have a staff, to have uh, comprehensive and updated uh, materials and provide a lot of the services that people need. Uh, in addition to having legal resources such as books, legal databases and so forth, we have copiers and uh, all those types of things that are, are uh, essential to getting things done. Computers, copiers, printers, everything like that. So it's a complicated world, uh, gets more complicated all along, and we do what we can to keep up with that, to keep up to date. Um, you know, we're, we're here in this course to sort of introduce folks to family law and to talk about what goes on here at the courthouse and talk about the law library uh, and what we can do to assist in that vein. Um, you know, in addition to this course, let's say we have the family law part two course in a couple of weeks, and we offer some other ones as well on, Basic Civil Litigation, uh, Courthouse 101 and Courthouse 102 courses. Uh, we have a state and probate, and legal research, and so forth. So Andrew and I, the other law librarian, uh, we split up those duties uh, in the presentations that we make. Uh, we have a website, we have a Facebook page, and if you kind of want to know what's going on, that's one resource. Obviously, you can always call us and email us uh, to uh, to let you know to see what's going on and if you have any questions. Um, People are either represented by lawyers or they are what's called pro se. Pro se meaning to represent oneself. Uh, and the law library, one of our essential services is providing servant, uh, assistance to pro se folks. Not acting as their attorneys, but doing as much as we can to them to give them access to materials and information they can utilize in handling their own case. We help attorneys as well. They come in here, they're part of our patron base. Uh, a lot of them are criminal defense attorneys, but they come from uh, all practice areas, whether they do a state and probate, family law, criminal, uh, other civil litigation, things of that nature. They come and use our computers and databases and services 
uh, meeting rooms and so forth. So uh, yeah, uh, pro se folks, that's a lot of what we're here to assist. And unfortunately, in some respects, some people choose to represent themselves because that's what they want to do. Uh, some people uh, choose to represent themselves or have to because they feel they have to uh, due to the cost of having an attorney and things of that nature. Uh, we have the district courts here, and that's what the family law courts are part of. Oh. Okay, it looks like you're joining again. Hold on one second. Can you, uh, can you hear me, Mr. Perkins? Are you in the class? Just want to make sure. Looks like you're in here twice, so... I'll keep on going then. Uh, like I said, the family law courts are part of the district courts. There's different uh, levels of courts in Texas. As far as trial level goes, there's the JP courts, there's the county courts of law, there's the district courts, and those courts have their jurisdictions, uh, their areas that they handle. Sometimes there's a bit of overlap, uh, but then there's some clear things. Family law matters are exclusively handled by district courts, and there's three district courts that are only uh, family law case uh, courts. The other five courts handle a, a combination of civil and criminal matters, felonies uh, and civil matters of a certain nature and involving a certain amount of money in controversy. Each of the family law courts is also assisted by an associate judge. Uh, it, that goes to the fact that they have an extensive docket and they, they need as many people helping as possible. Uh, so there's judges that are appointed uh, to assist the presiding elected judge in handling their extensive dockets. And uh, the judges, I know they keep put plenty busy along with their staff members. Uh, so the three family law courts are the 328th, 387th, and the 505th. And each of these courts, uh, they handle all these different matters. And there's a lot of different things that come under the umbrella of family law. Obviously divorces come to mind first. Uh, but there's things that follow on from divorce. Uh, if the divorce has involved children, there's custody and support issues that might be litigated further uh, as things go along. Say if somebody gets divorced uh, when the children, let's say a child is five, uh, the family law court's going to have a continuing jurisdiction over that child and their relationship with the family until they're 18. Uh, there's original suits, uh, suits affecting parent-child relationship that can be bought brought under varying circumstances. Say the, you know, there's an unmarried couple and the mother is seeking support uh, for their child from the biological father, uh, a suit affecting parent-child relationship, a SAPSER might be filed. There's termination of parental rights for various reasons. There's adoptions, there's name changes. Uh, there is modification and enforcement of family law orders. Uh, a lot of different things are handled, juvenile law, uh, the juvenile criminal law is a part of the family law courts. Uh, those matters are considered civil in nature, though they are uh, regarding criminal acts, uh, juvenile delinquency, uh, and so forth. So those are handled by the family law courts as well. Uh, we talk about the associate judges. They generally have almost all the powers of a presiding judge, though their, their decisions can be reviewed uh, by the presiding judge. Uh, there's court staff that assist the court in, uh, assist the pay, uh, pro se folks and the parties uh, and the attorneys in, in doing what they need to do. There's court clerks, coordinators, the court reporter, the bailiff. Uh, those are all involved uh, you know, behind the scenes and in the courtroom. Uh, this is kind of some information about the district courts in particular, about the judges. Uh, their contact information, the 328th here, their websites, uh, you know, it's important. I will say that when you do get assigned to one of the family law courts for your family law case, it's important to get on that court's website. Each court has some particulars about how they do things, their procedures, their protocols. It's essential to do that to help you navigate as uh, smoothly as possible uh, getting your case through that court. And so it's important to know uh, it's, it's, it's crucial, especially now where we're doing things a bit differently, unfortunately, due to the COVID-19. There is uh, a less uh, in-person uh, hearing of cases. And so how are things being done? Are they they're being done via Zoom, such as this uh, 
this class. They're doing hearings via Zoom. They're doing things on the paperwork if possible. You know, instead of having a hearing, having the parties uh, say in an agreed matter, uh, execute some affidavits. So say you have, say you have a couple, uh, no kids, they're getting a divorce and they're uh, agreeable at least to working together to uh, accomplish the divorce. Uh, instead of having to have a hearing, uh, the parties can execute affidavits uh, and turn in their paperwork to the court and ideally we'll get it done through that process. Hopefully we'll get back to normal at some point, but right now that seems a ways off. Uh, so there's a, you know, in addition to just dealing normally with the court's procedures, uh, now we're dealing with a different issue that makes things a bit more complicated. Uh, so it can be a bit daunting for pro se folks trying to handle things themselves under normal circumstances. Uh, it's a little, maybe a little harder now. So uh, we try to do what we do to help. So here's further information regarding these different courts. Um, like I said, go on their website. It talks about, you know, their forms library, their checklist, their how do you, you know, do certain things, that court's rules of practice. It's really important to know that stuff. Uh, it's important when you're a lawyer. When I, when I was practicing, uh, as soon as I, you know, had a new case and you find out what court you're in, you know, it's essential to, you know, go on, look at their procedures, or especially if you're going to be doing something in the court. So you're like, okay, I'm going to file a motion in that case, you know, a particular type of motion. Maybe I'm going to file a motion for continuance, say, to get the case uh, delayed or something. Well, they have particular procedures. You know, those motions are only heard on every other Thursday at 3 o'clock. Well, that's important to know, uh, to get on their proper docket. You know, so in addition to rules and procedures that uh, govern all continuances, say, through the rules of civil procedure, there are some particulars about how courts do things because they have to organize themselves and how they do stuff. You know, these days are set aside for certain types of things. You know, these days are set aside for trials. These days are set aside for hearings uh, and so forth. So it's very important. Uh, like I said, talking about some of the protocols that have changed impacting the courts, uh, the clerk's offices, the law library, you know, everything's kind of affected right now and, and we're no exception. So it's important to know uh, what's going on with your court uh, the, the clerk's offices are open. Uh, the, the ones here at the Justice Center, definitely. Uh, there's some satellite offices, I believe, that are closed. So it's important to get on uh, maybe the court's web or the clerk's websites to make sure uh, you know what's going on with them as well. Uh, you can get through that through the Fort Bend County uh, website, fortbendcountytx.gov. Then you go to the government tab then you search your particular department, say it's district clerk or county clerk, and then you can kind of, and then you get to their information on their web page. So, and it's, you know, it's impacted us here at the law library, unfortunately. Uh, we're sort of partly open, partly closed. Uh, we uh, have to admit attorneys and county staff. Uh, we can't at this time admit the general public. Uh, that's the same for all the libraries in our system. And so we're operating under different protocols. The regular libraries, the ones that just, you know, loan books and so forth, you know, they're closed physically to people, but they are doing a sort of drive-by curbside book pickup thing. So you can order books online uh, or call them, I believe, uh, each branch and, and uh, have books checked out via your library card in that manner. So we're doing what we can to still provide services. The law library is a little more active than some of the other branches just by the nature of where we are and what we do. Uh, we still help people at the door so the you know, pro se folks can come to the door. We talk to them about their issues. If we can print them forms or provide information on the spot, we'll do so. If it's going to take a little more work to gather information and such, we'll even, you know, get their contact information and email what we can to them. They can obviously, people can call us at our main number that's here on this page. Uh, they can also email our general email, uh, llpublic at fortben.lib.tx.us or my contact info is also in this, uh, um, in this PowerPoint. Make sure there's no one else looking. Okay, it's just us. So, like I said, there's, so let's kind of talk a little bit more about some of the other uh, things that are going on here at the courthouse. I had a sidebar there to talk about the COVID-19 issues, but you know, one thing, a big issue in family law is child support. So there is a particular court that handles child support through the attorney general's office. The attorney general uh, assists uh, in getting uh, child support issues uh, resolved, uh, having child support being provided. It's, it's one of their duties. Uh, so 
the state has an interest in uh, children being supported, and so they'll pursue those interests uh, and get involved. So there's a particular court lent over to that that meets from time to time uh, in one of the uh, auxiliary courtrooms here. So there's a judge, Judge Stabenow, who handles those matters. Obviously, again, things are probably impacted by uh, COVID-19. So, uh, you know, you have to probably call. Uh, here's the number listed for the Attorney General's court. Uh, the Attorney General has an office here in uh, Rosenberg, just uh, not far from here, um, uh, to assist in that manner. So those uh, attorneys come over here uh, to practice. There's a Fort Bend County Child Support Office. So sometimes uh, child support's uh, handled through the county uh, as sort of the uh, gatekeeper on child support issues. So they're right here across the street from the Justice Center, and this is their contact information. The district clerk has, like I said, I was talking about, they're the, they're the folks that you file your papers with. Uh, you can file in person. Uh, attorneys are required to file via uh, e-filing, but uh, pro se folks can file in person. Uh, just like here, you just, you know, basically you've got to have a mask on, certain protocols going on at this point, but uh, they're here and fully open for business. Uh, so when you get involved in the family law courts, uh, you know, if you start a matter, uh, if you file a case, you're the petitioner. If you're the sort of responding party, you're called the respondent. Uh, you know, kind of replacing the terms plaintiff and defendant, uh, to be a little more accurate uh, and representative of the relative positions of the parties. Uh, the being one or the other does not provide you a legal advantage. You know, you're not looked on worse because you're the respondent in a divorce case. Typically, the petitioner, in a manner of speaking, drives the bus a little bit more, maybe, uh, as far as, you know, directing the litigation, but that doesn't have to be that way. Respondents can be uh, proactive as well. So how do things get going? Uh, you know, the old-fashioned way was you filed your case and you asked the court to, or you asked the clerk to serve uh, the other side, maybe a deputy going through the door, uh, maybe certified mail, and so forth, and what they're bringing or what they're sending is citation and service process. Citation is a formal notice from the clerk and the court that the person has been sued, that they've been brought into a legal case. Uh, it kind of gives them formal notice of that fact uh, and some of the things that are, uh, that they are now they're on a timeline, uh, deadline to respond to that. Uh, and their failure to respond can have negative consequences, of course. So it's a fully kind of about fairness and fully apprising someone that they're uh, involved in a case uh, giving them information and how to start addressing that. Uh, and then what they're also serving then is the, the starting document, the petition, uh, which is the document that starts a lawsuit. That might be served with a notice of hearing or something else as well. But in general, it's the citation and the initial uh, pleading, the petition, uh, and that's called service of process. Uh, there's, you know, some different ways this can be done depending on the circumstances. Like I said, sort of the traditional way of someone coming to the door, knock, knock, knock. Are you Bill Smith? Yes. Oh, here's your papers. You've been served. Uh, there's other manner for doing that, depending on the nature of the party, the nature of the case. Uh, generally, natural persons are served in person or via certified mail. Uh, they can be served by, you know, by a deputy or a process server. Uh, other entities, such as corporations and so forth, there's different means of serving them. Uh, we don't need to really get into that here, but uh, we've kind of talked about it more in the family law case, but just to apprise you. Um, there can be some other methods, obviously. It's a, it's a key issue. It's a key point in getting people involved in the litigation, getting the parties before the court. So the court has jurisdiction, power to hear the case. They don't have it until both parties are properly before the court. How that is accomplished can vary. Uh, we've talked about sort of the traditional way in person or certified mail service, but circumstances might warrant there being uh, other means used. And we in these next few slides, we talk about that. What if the person never comes to the door? You just never can catch up with them. They don't want to answer the door. You know, the police don't, the deputies don't have the uh, ability to just, you know, knock down the door to serve civil process. You know, there you have to knock, no one answers. You know, they'll try a few times, but you know, if it doesn't work, but this is a good address and nobody wants to answer, uh, then you can ask the court to, to allow for uh, what's called substituted service, where the service process server is just going to leave the paperwork, you know, on the doormat or, uh, you know, taped to the front door. And that will suffice if the judge says that that is appropriate. Uh, there's service by posting and publication, you know, just because you're married to someone, but you've lost touch with them, they left and moved away. Maybe they moved back home to their former country, uh, or they just, you know, moved away and you don't know where they are. Uh, 
you know, it's not going to keep you from getting divorced, but there's uh, some steps you'll have to go through to accomplish these other forms of service uh, that aren't as likely to technically or actually reach them, but it will suffice for what's called due process. You know, you did as best we could under the circumstances. Somebody don't want to be found. Uh, that's not uh, our problem. Uh, we're just going to have to make sure that they get served in some manner that uh, satisfies due process. So, you know, if there's a divorce with children, don't know where the person is, you can serve them by publication upon order of the court. Uh, that means that the notice will be put in those back pages of the newspaper that nobody ever reads. Uh, the other way, if it's a divorce, say, without children, uh, it can be accomplished by posting, which means essentially posting those papers on the bulletin board of the courthouse. Uh, and they have to be there for a certain amount of time. Once that's done, they're considered served and the divorce can proceed with or without them. Uh, there's a waiver of service form. Uh, it's you know, commonly used now and it's a nice alternative for folks. Like I said, you're getting a divorce, so obviously the marriage broke down, but uh, maybe you don't have to hate each other and maybe you say, let's accomplish this divorce as adults. Let's get it done together, get it done properly. Uh, you can use the waiver of service form that skips, say, formal service the expense of it and the unnecessariness of it. You can simply hand them a copy of the petition that was filed along with the waiver of service form. And if it's executed uh, properly uh, before a notary and returned to the clerk, now both parties are before the court and the court now has jurisdiction and power to hear the case. Uh, so this is kind of, like I said, I sort of talked about it without going through the slides. These slides cover those service issues. Um, so issues, uh, another issue with the uh, uh, family law cases in any case, I've talked about it a little bit. I've talked about jurisdiction. That is the legal power for a court to uh, hear a case. It's based on subject matter. Uh, district courts have subject matter jurisdiction over family law cases. So that's the proper jurisdiction for that topic, as opposed to say, a state and probate here in Fort Bend County, which is handled by the county courts at law. So uh, a district court does not have subject matter jurisdiction over a state and probate matters. Uh, they do over family law. And then they also have to have jurisdiction power over the actual person. That's personal jurisdiction. Those two things have to uh, be accomplished for divorce cases and other family law cases. It's largely a function of uh, where the parties live and how long they've lived there uh, for uh, uh, jurisdiction to be proper under Texas family law courts. Then the venue goes to where the case is actually filed. And that goes across all cases, whether it's a car wreck case or a probate case or uh, something else. Uh, the venue, what's the proper county for the uh, case to be filed in? And there can be more than one at times, uh, but there's rules at least uh, generally one of the parties to a marriage uh, has to have lived in the county at least 90 days. So say you've got you know, a husband, lives now in Harris County, uh, but your wife still lives here in Fort Bend County and has, you know, for the last 10 years, she decides to file for divorce. Fort Bend County generally would be a proper county for that filing. You know, just always a word to the wise for folks is, you know, it's not fun. It can be distasteful, heart-wrenching, a drag, time-consuming, uh, always dealing with this legal stuff. Uh, but if you don't respond, if you don't act, react, be proactive, as appropriate, then you're lessening your chances of having at least a fair and positive outcome for you. Doesn't mean you're going to win, but you know, if you don't do something, you're probably going to lose. Uh, and always with legal stuff, there's deadlines. Uh, always the deadlines, always times you have in which to do things. And if you miss them, sometimes those uh, things can be undone, but sometimes they can't. So it's just, you got to be, stay on top of it as best as possible. Uh, and react. Uh, I just kind of always talk about that. I try to hammer it home to people because, uh, you know, it needs to be hammered home. Uh, you don't want to set yourself up for a default judgment where an important issue uh, is uh, decided maybe negatively uh, for you uh, without your involvement. You get a default judgment. You don't want to get a default judgment and have your uh, kids, you know, not say taken away from you, but you know your custody matters with your kids being affected or child support being affected without your involvement. Uh, you don't want to be at somebody else's mercy. You want to at least uh, be able to put on your side of things. Like I said, we talk about the waiver of service form and substituted service. So there's some details uh, in here on those issues. Um, 
So um, I'm going to, some of these same things are covered in the Courthouse 101 PowerPoint because uh, there's a lot of overlap in things and how uh, things are done. You know, there's important things in the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure about the computation of time. How do I know, you know, how long I have to respond to things? How do I, what's the proper way I serve documents on the other sides? What are the rules regarding that? What are the rules regarding things like statutes of limitations and how do I structure my legal pleadings and so forth? And so that information in some respects is covered in our other classes. And obviously we have materials here uh, that can assist with that too. The overriding principle uh, in family law cases involving children is the best interest of the child. So that's gonna be the paramount uh, concern that the family law courts are going to have to rule under uh, pursuant to state law. Section 153.002 of the Family Code. You know, in addition to the Family Code, you have things such as the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure that are come, come into play, the Texas Rules of Evidence. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different statutory uh, law that will have a basis on how things, on how your case will progress. And you have to apprise yourself of those because that is the law. Whether you're pro se or not, uh, you're subject to it. Uh, so there's some terminology uh, that you hear regularly and is regularly used in family law cases. Conservatorship, that's a, a fancy term for custody. You know, what types of conservatorship? There's different types. There's joint managing conservatorship, sort of is the standard default, but not say default, but sort of the standard one that will usually apply unless factors are brought in uh, showing that sole managing conservatorship invested in one of the parents is appropriate. You know, there's possession and visitation. You know, the person, the parent who the children doesn't live with, uh, what is going to be the scheduling and circumstances under which uh, the children go uh, visit and stay with the other parent. Uh, there's different types of visitation that can be set down. Property issues is, of course, one of the other primary things in a divorce, whether it's with or without children. Uh, community property, separate property, that's a terminology. Community property is generally things that are acquired during the marriage are presumed to be community property, meaning equally owned by both spouses unless it can be shown otherwise, unless you can prove that it's separate property. So uh, that's just sort of a sampling of some of the things that uh, terminology and topics that are going to be at issue in uh, family law cases. You know, there's divorces and there's different rules uh, and circumstances in, in divorces. Are they with or without children? That's a big uh, deal. Are they agreed or are they more uh, contested or arm's length type process? Uh, we kind of just talk about some of the things here, some of the general process steps uh, in a divorce case. The paperwork that we provide provides instructions as well. And we have materials here that talk about the nitty gritty, the details. How do these cases progress? What are some of the ins and outs and the, the facts? I mean, these are books that lawyers use and need to know about, uh, you know, how the rubber meets the road, I guess, you know, how, how are things going to go? We have practice guides, we have rules, uh, we have forms, uh, all those types of things. So, you know, there's steps in these cases that are going to have to be uh, dealt with. And there's other matters, obviously, divorce is sort of the primary, but there's all kinds of other things that we sort of talked about, paternity cases, uh, adoption cases, modification uh, of uh, existing family law orders under appropriate circumstances. Motions to enforce, somebody's not living up to what they're supposed to do uh, pursuant to the court and you have to take it back to court and get the court to strictly enforce it through motion to enforce or motion for contempt. Uh, there's annulments, name changes are part of uh, the family law courts and surprisingly it's a significant uh, thing. A lot more people are getting name changes for themselves or their children than I ever would have thought but it's a regular thing here. Probably a day doesn't go by that I don't provide somebody with name change forms. Uh, when you get involved in a family law case, oftentimes temporary orders are put into place to govern uh, the state of affairs while the case is pending. You know, how are the kids gonna be supported or what's the custody arrangements gonna be while the divorce case is pending? Uh, like I said, we have forms on that. Uh, the courts uh, have some agreed forms as well, some of their standard things governing this. Protective orders are part of family law. Unfortunately, it's a thing that, that comes up quite often. People are threatened by family members or other people, and uh, uh, courts uh, are, have to deal with that, and sometimes they have to issue them, sometimes they don't. Uh, the complaint made does not reach the standard, but we have a packet of documents that helps people with protective orders, uh, trying to get them 
uh, and those are provided free of charge. I don't believe there's any filing fee either considering the nature of the, of the case. Uh, you know, there's termination of parental rights and step parent adoption. Uh, that comes up sometimes where, uh, say, a father, a stepfather is uh, involved in a child's life, and the sometimes the biological father will voluntarily terminate their parental rights uh, in favor of uh, the stepfather, you know, in the best interest of the child, really, uh, to uh, give that child maybe the, the best uh, chance at a, at a, at a you know, cohesive family life. Sometimes termination of parental rights comes up in an involuntary nature if the parents are abusive, uh, unfit. I guess it would have to be pretty extremely unfit due to things such as drug use and other things like that. So we have information that we can provide to people for uh, termination and adoption issues. So going into, I know we have to go kind of fast on these things, on these uh, classes sometimes, and that's why I'm glad to provide you a copy of the PowerPoint. And, of course, I'm at your disposal for questions and stuff, but let's talk a little bit about what we have to assist with this. Our two heavy hitter databases are Westlaw and Lexis, very extensive coverage on uh, case law, statutory law, and secondary resources, such as practice guides and forms. We have these databases on several computers, and the materials contained on there can be delivered to our patrons in a variety of ways. It can be via email. People can come in, and, you know, thumb drives, they can print stuff. Uh, it's it's really user friendly uh, for sure, and our coverage is excellent. Uh, you know, we have some Lexis Digital Library stuff that I think you're familiar with, Mr. Perkins. Uh, you can access Lexis to a certain extent via your library card, via the uh, library website. Uh, we have other databases. O'Connor's uh, is now actually part of Westlaw, but it's an excellent group of practice guides and forms uh, for Texas and also federal. Uh, excellent materials uh, extremely used by uh, the legal community. Uh, we just have other stuff as well. We have things through James Publishing and the State Bar. Texas Law Help is an essential website that we use to provide basic family law forms to people. Um, you know, we have things in print, uh, some of our samples of our books. You know, there's some other things out there that are also fall under family law that people are uh, maybe not aware of. Uh, Texas Department of Family and Protective Services, as a way to uh, you know have you know temporary control over children, uh, you don't have to maybe surrender full custody of kids, but maybe somebody needs to step in while uh, a parent is maybe in rehab or a parent is simply working out of state and they need to be left with grandma. And grandma needs to have the full power to take care of the kids, such as making you know medical decisions and school involvement and so forth. So there's some other avenues uh, for folks uh, besides just having court orders. Uh, State vital statistics up that kind of stands for itself. There's certain things are turned over to the to the state vital statistics, birth certificates, death certificates, marriage certificates, uh, divorces, adoptions, things of that nature, keeping up with those basic uh, stats. Uh, if you lose uh, at the family court, you can, uh, under circumstances, seek review of those decisions either by the trial court again through a motion for new trial or through appeals to the uh, appellate courts. Obviously, those things have deadlines that have to be abided by if you're going to appeal. Uh, here's our contact information. Uh, like I said, there's my email and stuff. You're always welcome to email me or give me a call. I'd be glad to help as much as I can. Uh, like I said, we're, we've got a full panoply of services here. Uh, anything you really need, we have obviously current circumstances prevent uh, the utilization by a lot of these by the general public and hopefully sometime in the near future, we will get back to normal. Uh, the Fort Bend County website, like I talked about, you can access most uh, county departments uh, and each one of them has a web page and a lot of information. And I think we're about to run out of time here. Uh, there's ways to find an attorney. We can give you information about seeking one. We can't recommend them, but we can uh, give you resources to try and find one. There's just different ways to do that. You know, there's always some other uh, good links in here uh, to various websites, Texas Law Help and so forth. It's uh, essential to our job. And I think I'm just about out of time. I'm sorry I always have to rush through the last couple of steps, but I uh, really appreciate being a patron of our library and a good friend of us. And anything we can do, we will always do it. So thank you and have a good day.